Good evening. My name is John Milburn and this is week two of term three 2018 for laws 13010 evidence and proof. Thank you for those people that have joined live. For, for those watching the recorded session, please do consider joining the session live when you can. Um, if you have any questions, please ask through Q&A and I promise to get to them as soon as I can. Now, um, William Billings has prepared a Facebook group for the first assessment. So well done. I'm not sure if that's working, but uh, because I don't go on Facebook, but it's a good innovation. So thank you very much for that. Now, um, are there any questions? Sarah, do you have a question about the first assessment? Yes. So I was reading through the first assessment and thinking about what questions I would ask, but I had a couple of queries about sort of the material facts of the incident, such as, because it talks about the car being parked on the in front of the building and the guy being in a park across the road. Um, I was kind of wondering how many lanes the road is and how busy the traffic is and whether there's actual parallel parking because um, those seem somewhat relevant for me. Exactly. And, um, you know, sometimes this is um, a punt that you need to take. In reality, if you're for prosecution, you, you would have had a chance to proof your witness and gone through a lot of the detail um, and um, perhaps in, even inspected the site or looked at photographs. So there's many more opportunities in real life than there are in this circumstance. So to some degree, if you wish to elicit evidence, you may have to take a punt. But um, um, if you're the prosecutor, your, your job is to draw the evidence out of the witness um, so that the witness has an opportunity to have their say the real trap with prosecution would be to ask a question that invites the witness to answer something that might, at worst, cause a mistrial as a result of the evidence that is given, or it may create something that is adverse to, uh, to the case. Um, for defence, it's a little different. Um, what you're concerned about there is not giving the witness an opportunity to provide something that would be adverse to defence. So often when you're cross-examining, it's more like a series of statements where you're simply saying, yes, you want the witness to say yes or no. It's dangerous if you're cross-examining to give the witness too much rope because they may say something that is adverse to you. So Sarah, I know that's a very indirect answer to your question. Um, and the facts that you've been provided are pretty narrow but um, you can explore uh, and go I further if you what wish. What I'm asking is, with regards to those sort of questions, would they be, like, from a defence's perspective, okay to ask? Because, like, I mean, in a real case, you might have the facts, but if having said facts will help your case, would that be included in your 20 questions? Yes. Um, and I'm glad that you raised the 20 questions because this is an important aspect of that. The reason I ask you to provide up to 20 questions is really to see if you've got an idea of appropriate process. And you need to listen carefully to this if you're listening as a recorded session. You are not in any way constrained by 20 questions. You are not constrained by having to answer, ask those questions in the order that you present them to me. So the purpose of presenting the up to 20 questions to me is quite different to the live session. I hope that makes sense. So submit the questions to me. It will give me an idea if you've got an, you know, a good grasp of what a prosecutor will do, what a defence counsel will do. But when it comes to the live session, you need to, you can ask as many questions as you like, but probably don't go beyond 15 minutes um, because this is set up so it's a, basically a half hour for the, for the two of you. Um, you can go a little longer if you need to, uh, but you'll be surprised how, how long the 15 minutes can take. Um, so don't go beyond 15 minutes, but if you just ask the 20 questions, you probably won't get to 20 minutes uh, or 15 minutes. So you can ask 100 questions if you like, um, but only submit 20 to me, just to, even if it's a sample. And um. the second aspect is be, listen very carefully to the responses because that may, have, may force you to go a different way. Yeah, sorry, Sarah. 
I'm assuming that means that in the live, say you ask a question that has a yes or no answer, um, and then you know you have one way you want to go if they say yes, and one way they want to go where they say no. You don't have to necessarily have all those questions in your submission. Not at all. So you may have mapped out a strategy, yes, with a flow chart, yes or no, type responses, but you could almost be guaranteed that it, it will be difficult to stick to the flow chart. It'll be difficult uh, to stick to the script. I hope that makes sense and is not scaring you too much. But um, when it comes to evidence and proof, it is a very practical subject. And it's a subject where sometimes people who may not have done so well academically in the past really shine. ADR is another one like this where if you have a live mediation session, sometimes people really do well. Conversely, people that have done well academically may not be so strong when it comes to the live performance in evidence and proof or something like ADR. I hope that makes sense. Again, that's not to encourage or discourage anyone in particular, but just a general observation that I've noticed over the last few years. So some of the questions coming through, um, that means we're asking something we don't know, says Michael. Yes, when you're asking as prosecutor, you're asking open-ended questions, and whilst you would expect the witness, which will be me, to stick, to stick primarily to the script, I may vary from the script, or I may add or delete or embellish or um, change what's there. Now, that's just a re reality. People do that in real life and prosecutors I think have a really hard time because they're trying they've proofed their witness they've got a very clear idea of what they expect the witness will say and then sometimes the witness just does not come up to proof the witness says something which is short of what the witness said during the interviews leading up to the trial and it's the art of prosecution is to try and turn back and without leading the witness provide the witness with an opportunity to answer the question in a more appropriate manner, if that makes sense. So you've got to be careful about not crossing the line and leading the witness, but going back and perhaps asking in a slightly different way um, in order to extract the information that you know is there, but the witness is just not saying it or not saying it the, the way you expected them to do so. For defence, it's a little different. If you ask open questions and you provide the witness with the opportunity to, to elaborate or expand, then that may not help. So when you're defence, you're really trying to pin the witness down into a position with little wriggle room. I hope that makes sense. Michael, does that answer your question? And the answer is yes. You may ask something you don't know. The general rule is you don't, you, you try not to do that. I was going to say, that's the commandment you gave us in stage. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. That, I mean, let's make that a general rule. Um, but given that there's, it's a very short statement and you haven't had an opportunity to engage with this witness before the live event, um, you may well find that you're asking questions where you don't know the answer, which may give you an opportunity to show how you light you are on your feet and demonstrate your mental agility when it comes to retracing the careful plan that you'd, you'd prepared. Um, and again, I don't mean to say this to scare you. It's unlike, for example, some other assessments where you can have as many dry runs as you want. This one is you get a one-off chance with the witness. So um, you need to prepare, even though it's only 15 minutes, you, you need to spend many hours thinking about the questions, the, the answers, the possible answers, and really importantly, and sometimes people overlook this, have a look at the evidence and think about it from a logical perspective and say, is that everything? Could there be more? Was there something else that may be relevant? And there may be some subtle hints in the material which give you an idea of what questions you might ask and you might come up with a gold mine of material, either as defence or or prosecution. I know that's all very vague, but I guess what I'm trying to say is feel that you've got a sense of freedom, but be light on your feet and ready to um, uh, be to manoeuvre in different ways when you're in the live session. 
Now, Keith said, I thought one of the key rules was you don't ask a question to which you do not know the answer. Absolutely, Keith. I think that is a key rule, generally speaking, but we need to be a bit flexible on this one. Robert says, just out of curiosity, and sorry to hijack the chat, how many people are on the Facebook group? Um, I don't know, is William here? No, does anyone know? Elise says, I'm on the Facebook group. Not a lot of chat at the moment. Um, so, Eve, would you, and Elise, would you recommend the Facebook group? Previously, I'd use a thing called Ucrew, was like Facebook, but I don't have that this year. Eve or Elise, is the Facebook, is it, yes, Eve? Yeah, I'd say it's handy, I suppose. Um, it has been a little bit quiet of late, but you never know what gems are going to come up. <laughs> Very good. Thank you. Um, now, any other questions on the first assessment? Elise says, good for finding a partner. Yes, that's, that's probably a primary aim. You don't have to have a partner. You can do this as a live session. Probably you're restricted then to being prosecution. Um, defence does, it does help if you've heard what was said during the um, evidence in chief so that you can tailor your questions appropriately. I do encourage you to find a partner if you can, but if you can't or you just don't want to have work with a partner, just let me know and we'll do a live, we'll just do a, a live session just one on one. But um, the other advantage of having a partner is it gives you a, a chance to engage and speak with that person about the uh, task. And uh, I'm happy for you to do that. Laura. Uh, sorry. Yes, didn't Kate. I just, didn't you just say you had the option to be flexible? Yes, you can. So you've got the option. Um, you don't have to have a partner. If you say, look, I just want to do this on my own. I don't want to join up with anyone and have a partner in it. Um, you can let me know and I will just have a one-on-one -on -one session with you rather than one with my session with two people. Now, bear in mind, no. this is not a group assessment. It's an individual assessment. And the, uh, the only idea of finding a partner is that it's someone convenient to join that session live and one can be prosecution, one can be defence. But mm. you're not in any way marked on what the other one is doing. I hope that uh, makes sorry. sense. I was more talking about consistency between, if I have a partner, between consistent uh, prosecution and defence, irrespective of whether they're prosecution or defence. It works best if we have two people because then we can have uh, have that even spread. Otherwise, if people are, uh, elect only to be on their own, then we're going to have many more prosecutors uh, than defence. Um, and I think prosecution is a little more difficult than uh, defence. That's my personal view. All right, I hope that answers some questions. Any other? Yes, Sarah? There's no particular format for the word submission. You can do it as a list or a yep. flow chart or whatever. Yep. Um, so don't worry. Other, yeah, just any, any format that you like. And the other question is, um, is it okay to share our questions between prosecution and defence or do mm -hmm. you not recommend that or what? Well, look, usually, of course, you wouldn't do that, but I'm happy for you to do that and to discuss the um, task. I don't see that as collusion in any way, and I'm happy for you to uh, discuss it. And part of it is that it's a learning process, and we want to, you know, exchange ideas, and I'm happy for you to do that. Ultimately, when it comes to the task, it's up to you individually, and they will be your questions. But you, sure, you can um, even have a dry run. You can uh, ask someone to uh, act the part and see how you go. Do a bit of practice with a third party. No problem with that at all. I hope that answers your question, Sarah. Okay. So Robert says, best to go on your own then. Only one must pass. No, don't worry. Um, <laughs> there's no, uh, no um, bell curve here. So if the prosecution does an excellent job, they may get full marks. If defence does an excellent job in the same session, they may to also get full marks. So don't worry about um, having to share the good marks if you're going with someone else. Uh, none of those things apply. All right. Um, and I know that was tongue in cheek. So any other questions are all good. Okay. Let me um, show you something on the share facility, which emphasizes something that I have mentioned in the past in previous units and I, possibly even this one, 
encouraging people about the importance of subscribing to alert bulletins. So if you can see that screen, and it might be a bit small, you'll see that it's an extract from Barnett Jade, an excellent service, and it's free. On the 9th of November, I received into, into my inbox a report Sorry. about... Yes. Sorry, I don't think That's, anything's actually sharing. Isn't it sharing? Fire. All right. I'm not sure what it is. I'm, I'm just having some difficulty with my broadband, well, lack of broadband at the moment. So what I'll do is I'll just explain it to you. Firstly, can I just have a straw poll? This will get you working the, the fingers. Um, can you please tell me if you subscribe to Jade or any other alert bulletin service receiving material into your inbox? Can we have a yes or no? Yes, we're getting Jade, Jade and Osley. No, Jade, Jade, good, good, no. All right, if you're a no, and there's a few no's there, I encourage you to change that practice immediately. I like Jade, um, but it's not the only one. I subscribe to a few, but Jade's a good start. And um, Queensland Law Reports, yes, I subscribe to that as well, absolutely. Uh, get the Queensland Law Reporter. Yes, Sarah gets that as well. Each week you get the QLR, excellent service. Great advantage in terms of preparing for an exam because if you... Um, if you find out about a case the week before the examination and you're able to sensibly refer to that case in the exam, you're well on the way to getting a very good mark. So in this instance, I mentioned on the 9th of November, I received a report from Barnett Jade and it was in relation to McPhillamy against the Queen. That's M-C-P-H-I-L-L-A-M-Y against the Queen, 2018 HCA 52. It was a decision of the full court um, of the High Court, sorry, of the, um, of the High Court rather, and um, it was to do with evidence, criminal trials, sexual offense, offences, tendency evidence and admissibility. And uh, it was a case that um, will be relevant to you in your studies, even though it was only handed down on the 8th of November. So I, I received an alert and an, an access to the case itself on the 9th of November. All right, so that's the importance of um, perhaps joining Facebook or, or asking Q&A and having the alert bulletins. Now let's talk about the common law, Queensland evidence law and the uniform evidence law. Before I do, can anyone tell me what is a code? What's a code in the context of legislation? A code affects, like, basically takes all the common law away and replaces it with one statutory law, whereas mm -hmm. in Queensland we're not in that situation. Very yep, very good. Excellent. What about in a Commonwealth level in evidence law? Sarah says, for example, the criminal code, yes, in Queensland. Angela? Um, I found it interesting. You can subscribe to it. So that Commonwealth one, you can choose to subscribe to it, like each of the states could. Um, mm -hmm. And it was New South Wales and ACT who wholeheartedly agreed to it. Um, and wouldn't they have been the people who had a lot to do with preparing that legislation? <laughs> Quite possibly, <laughs> yes, <laughs> from a practical perspective. And the states that have said no, well, certainly Queensland has its own original um, Evidence Act. Now, I'm, one resource I find useful is this one, the Australian Law Dictionary. This one is by Oxford. And code says a comprehensive coverage of an area of law, often to the exclusion of any other expression of law on the topic. In civil law countries, fully codified law is the norm, whereas the code covers the field that is no, there is no norm for development of the law by case law. So in Australia, yeah, I agree with what Angela says, although the idea of the code is that it's intended to be comprehensive, but not necessarily to the exclusion of any other law, in that we still have some degree of common law running concurrently with the code, in the sense that once, say, for example, the criminal code is enacted, we then have cases that deal with sections within the criminal code, so that in that sense, the common law builds on or expands or better explains the code. But the idea of the code is, yes, it's meant to be comprehensive. In evidence law, 
essentially the Uniform Evidence Act or law is meant to be a code um, largely, uh, whereas Queensland is not. So when we talk about the common law in evidence law, it will, the common law, I guess by necessary implication from that statement, will have greater influence or effect in Queensland evidence law than will be the case when dealing with the Commonwealth Evidence Act or the Uniform, which is also the Uniform Evidence Laws. So you need to perhaps just have a refresher in terms of um, the, the way in which laws are made um, and think about the issue of codes. Now, when it comes to evidence law, we're talking about uh, the forms of evidence. We're talking about evidentiary principles, rules, and largely, a lot of this unit will be talking about exceptions to rules. That will be particularly relevant in the context of hearsay. One of the key issues is determining the question of relevance. In other words, if something is not relevant, it won't ever make the grade as evidence. But we then need to consider things that might be relevant, but not necessarily admissible. So hearsay evidence, for example, comes to mind, or opinion evidence um, may not be admitted, even though they might be particularly relevant, if you understand what I'm getting at. So <clears throat> what we talk about when we're talking about evidence is that material which is offered in a trial to do something. So what's the main purpose of evidence, if you like? What do we seek to achieve by leading evidence? Yes, prove Robert. a case, or in, the, in most cases, to prove a particular side of a case. Yes, to prove a side, thank you. Uh, Sarah, what did you say, Robert? I just missed that. I said to persuade. Uh, to persuade, yes. Um, so proving a fact or a position says, Keith, persuade. Marcus agrees with you, Robert. And Sarah says to prove a case. And um, all of those things are true. In other words, if you have something that does not help to persuade or does not help to prove your case or prove a fact in issue, then you probably don't need to lead it as evidence. Probably not. I'll be guarded on that a bit because there are some situations where you may lead evidence, even though it is not directly relevant to a fact and issue, but generally speaking, evidence is that which helps the decision maker to reach a decision on the issues in dispute. Of course, we have an adversarial system as opposed to an inquisitorial system. Now, what that means then is that it's up to the parties to lead the evidence which they say will best suit their case and prove their point. But you've got to do so within the rules. You've got to do so fairly. I've just got a message here. My internet connection is unstable. If you start to not hear me clearly, please let me know. Um, so under the adversarial system, we need to therefore consider ethical duties, don't we? Because if you're hell bent, as it were, on winning your case, you may, be, may consider or may try to be tempted by the thought of leading only that evidence that helps you and ignoring that evidence which is against you. Can I ask you this question? And we'll, we'll have a yes or no answer to this. When it comes to obligations about leading evidence um, or facts that may help or may hinder, are the rules, are the ethical rules the same for prosecution and defence? Yes or no? No, no, in bold, no, no. Uh, no with a little rider, says Marcus. Okay. Yes, question mark. All right. Marcus mentioned what I was looking to extract from you, and that is in the context of prosecution, providing or leading evidence, 
generally speaking, they're governed by the model litigant rule. Um, and the same applies generally for counsel assisting, for example, in, um, in uh, a merits appeal. So uh, do you know what I mean by merits appeal if you've done civil procedure? Okay, so in a merits, merits review, merits appeal, quite often you'll, you'll have counsel for the regulating authority appear before the court or the tribunal and their job is to draw out evidence but assist by having the evidence that um, is necessarily, won't necessarily always be good, but it's the more entire evidence. So for prosecution, there is this model litigant principle and I'd urge you, as some of your homework this week, to do some research about the model litigant principle or obligations. So that is imposed on prosecution, not on defence. So in some ways, even though we've got this overriding duty to um, the administration of justice, there is a slight difference when it comes to the way in which prosecution and defence operate. And bear in mind, of course, in criminal proceedings, quite often defence won't lead evidence anyway. So evidence then is that which is presented in an adversarial system by a party with an intention to enable the finder of fact to reach a conclusion on issues in dispute that might assist that party um, subject to the model litigant principle. And Sarah said defence has no obligation to lead evidence and incriminates such as privileges, correct. So when we talk about evidence, we often talk in the conjunction with the case theory or the theory of the case, which is really what the party's version of events is all about. So when we talk about case theory or theory of the case, we're talking about what we actually think happened and the evidence is presented to assist the arbiter of fact, whether that's a judge, magistrate, jury or tribunal member, to see it that way, that there is a conclusion to be drawn based on those facts, which is in, in um, support of your case theory. I hope that makes sense. All right, now I mentioned earlier that um, in Queensland, we do not have a, an evidence act that's a code. And I mentioned that the uniform laws, they're not a comprehensive code, but they are code-like but where they do apply, they do replace the old common law rules that preceded them. That's not necessarily the case in Queensland. All right, um, let's get on the, we'll do some beat the buzzer time. So we're ready on the buzzers. A few questions. I want you to answer A, B or C, a really easy one to start with. On whom does the burden of proof fall? A, the accuser, B, the accused, or C, the judge? Oh, you're all quick on that one. And we all said correctly, A. Number two, um, <clears throat> you can, a yes or a no, or a yes with conditions, or no with conditions. You should listen carefully. Is the fact that a witness is agitated and uncomfortable while appearing in the witness box real evidence? Yes, no. All right, we're getting a mixture of votes, but about 50-50. Yeah, about 50-50, mostly no's. All right, so let's have a look at that. We have, firstly, is the premise of the question accurate? Is the arbiter of fact entitled at law to look at a witness and make an assessment that this person appears to be agitated and uncomfortable while giving their evidence. Is the arbiter of fact, say the jury, entitled to take that into account or are they only entitled to take into account what the person actually says and the content of what they say? Isn't so that part of the... Re yes, go, sorry. Go. Go. Um, I was going to say, isn't that part of the reason why they rather people come and give evidence rather than give written statements? Yes, very good, Angela. Michael, did you have something you wish to add to that? Oh, I sort of forgot what I was going to say, but in, the reality is that people are going to judge what they see, so that's going to happen no matter what. But mm. some people are ridiculously nervous in front of people, yep. so it's not, a, it's not a given. Okay, no, great answers. 
Um, and yes, I agree that a big part of why we have oral evidence is to test the quality of the evidence. And part of testing the quality evidence is not just what's said, but how it's said, how it's delivered, and how that person appears. So often when magistrates, for example, make a decision, they will rely upon making the decision on the way in which the person giving evidence presented that evidence. And they'll often refer to the demeanor of the evidence in conjunction with what was said by the witness. So, th so they'll talk about the demeanor of the witness rather, and not just what the witness said. So the demeanor is, is actual evidence. So, Given that that's, in, that's in, sorry, John, that's incredibly yes, subjective. It is, it is, and and of course it needs to be, in the sense that um, the arbiter of fact is there to determine did something happen or did it not, and our law provides them with some tools, subject to the rules. Ultimately, it comes at to, up to the, that person, the judge, the magistrate, the tribunal member, or in the criminal law context on indictment, the jury. So the jury is sitting there and they make a decision. For example, is this person guilty of, let's say, rape? And in coming to their decision, they consider all the evidence presented because the defence argument might be consent. And in order to determine this question, ultimately, it is inherently subjective. And ultimately, it comes down to the jury saying, well, I think it did or I think it didn't. You know, subject, of course, to the burden of proof, the standard of proof, the rules of evidence, all those sorts of things. But the ultimate question is subjective. And it's a really good point, Keith. I take that point. Um, some may say that's makes a bit of a mockery of the law, but ultimately someone's got to decide. And we set up the rules to make it as fair as possible to enable that person to make an appropriate decision or that group of people to make an appropriate decision based on the admissible evidence provided to them. Um, but of course, there may be other reasons why someone does have poor demeanor. Sarah's raised some points, perhaps chronic fear of public speaking. You know, being put in a witness box in front of a judge, a jury, barristers, solicitors, uh, members of the gallery, and having to give answers, who wouldn't, whose demeanour wouldn't be affected as a result of that? Um, yes, sir, Keith? Yeah, just uh, after having been pulled out of a queue at the airport and subjected to bomb testing on the basis that I was perspiring, because I'd walk from the hotel to the airport to cut, uh, jump on the plane. Yeah, I know. <laughs> it was completely subjective. Yeah, absolutely. Um, other points Michael raises, PTSD, depression, shyness, level of um, uncomfortability, um, and racial, racial prejudice may come into it, may make someone feel uncomfortable. So the whole range of issues as to why someone's demeanour may be affected as a result of giving evidence. However, good or bad, someone's demeanour is a fair game, as it were. Now, what type of evidence do we have in Queensland? What are the broad categories of evidence? Well, I've got three in mind. Uh, real? And, yes. Oral? Documentary? Yes. Excellent. All right. So if I'm suggesting to you that the way in which a witness appears in the witness box is evidence, in other words, the arbiter of fact is entitled to take that into account in making his, her or their decision, what type of evidence is that? We're getting some votes in. Real is the answer. I agree with that. However, it is real evidence, but considered or assessed in conjunction with the oral evidence, isn't it? So it's not as though the witness is sitting there mute. The witness is saying things at the same time. And you might say, 
what I'm hearing doesn't match what I'm seeing. And that's the difference, isn't it, between something which is a mere transcription of what was said as opposed to the overall effect of seeing both the, um, the real evidence and listening to the oral evidence because the two work in conjunction. You know, um, let's picture it in this sense. Someone is in a police interview. They're asked as to whether they committed the crime. They may have been giving a statement over the last two hours to the officer and they may be totally exhausted. So after two hours, the question is, did you commit the crime? And the person says, yeah, I did it. Now that person may be tired, vulnerable, have low intellect, uh, may have language difficulties, may have had a medical condition that meant that they had to get out of there. So there might be a whole range of reasons why they said what they did. But as a result of looking at that person in those circumstances, you may be able to say, I don't accept that that was really what they, I don't accept what they said is true. In this instance, I'm going to look at the real evidence of the overall demeanour and give that more weight than the oral evidence that I've heard. Does that make sense? Or it might be someone um, at the start of an interview. Did you, did, did you commit this willful damage? Did you throw the rock through the window? Yeah, I did it. But it may have been that they were flippant in their response. Or it may have been a sarcastic response. Um, as in someone delays by three or four seconds and says, oh yeah, I did that, you know, or whatever, whatever it is. So the demeanor is, is um, certainly important, but assess it with, in conjunction with the oral evidence and vice versa. Now, we're ready for another question. Is a photograph of a collision real or documentary evidence? The photograph. We're getting some votes in. Everyone says documentary. But it also would be evidence typically assessed in conjunction with the oral evidence. In other words, whilst the photograph may, as it were, speak for itself, it will be usually presented in conjunction with someone giving oral evidence. So again, there might be a mixed mixture there. Next question. Is the actual clothing worn by a murder victim real or documentary evidence? Real, 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 real. Everyone says real. Can it ever be documentary evidence? Can actual clothing ever be documentary evidence? Uh, destroyed. What's that? Destroyed. Clothes are destroyed. Then it can't be real, can it? Well, that's true. And then there might be a photograph of it, which is a document. So that's true. So a photo of it. Uh, if the wording needs to be used, says Marcus, that's the, that's the answer I was looking for. So the photograph is good um, as well. So Marcus, do you want to tell us why the wording on the clothing itself may be documentary evidence? I'm putting you on the spot here. Yes, Marcus. Sorry, John. I'm just trying to um, work it um, because it's writing. And the def definition of doc document is writing. That's it. It's as simple as that. Good. Thank you. Um, and it depends, of course, what it is that you're trying to assert is a fact for consideration. Now we know that evidence is oral, real, or documentary. And thank you, Marcus, for that. So, <clears throat> if it is real evidence the t-shirt or the shirt the worn by the uh, murder victim um, may be, is likely to be real evidence, might have blood on it. But in a different context, uh, clothing can be a document because of the wording. So um, if you're trying to establish the words that were written on that shirt for whatever reason, uh, you're not interested in the shirt, but you're interested in the words, then the shirt becomes a document. 
because if you look at the definition of document, it's very broad. It's not just a piece of paper. It can be all sorts of things. And what you're looking for in the document is the information contained within, for want of a better term, the vessel. Paper is in that context usually the vessel, but it might be that the, the words are contained on anything um, and a flash drive, for example. So think very email, yep. So think um, in terms of documents in a very broad manner. And again, homework this week, have a look at how we define documents within the Evidence Act, state and um, federal. Next question <clears throat> is the description by a valuer of the value of stolen antiques, real or documentary evidence. Oh, sorry, did I say real or documentary evidence? Huh. Sorry, I'm gonna change that and say oral, real or documentary. So is the evidence by a value? Sorry, so did he write it or is he telling us? <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. No, that's true. Exactly. That's a really good point. In the witness box, it would be oral evidence. But of course, it may be supplemented by documentary evidence. Um, or it may in fact be real evidence if the valuer is showing us the actual item that was stolen but recovered later. So, yep, good point. Thank you very much. That was a bit tricky, that question. So let's, um, I just want to have, ask you to look at question number five in study guide number one. You're probably aware that those questions that I've been asking are from the study guides. So those who are onto it were pretty quick. Um, but have a look at question number five in the study guide number one. Order the following four parties. And I think there's five there, isn't there? Um, from the party that meets the lowest standard of proof to the party that meets the highest standard of proof. The respondent in a contract case, a prosecution in a murder case, a civil litigant arguing their opponent committed a multi-million dollar fraud and appear an appellant to the AAT seeking a review of a passport decision or a criminal defendant asserting an alibi. So which has the lowest burden of proof out of that five? The defendant? Yep. A, the respondent in a contract case. In the answer guide, we've given A as the answer, but arguably E is correct because the criminal defendant need not do anything at all. But if the criminal defendant does assert an alibi, then there is the evidentiary burden that goes upon the criminal defendant to at least establish some evidence. Now, what that does is having established some evidence, the onus then goes on to prosecution to produce evidence sufficient to ensure um, that that defence is not uh, maintainable because ultimately the prosecution must prove beyond all reasonable doubt the guilt of the accused. So what the contrast between A, the respondent in a contract case, and E, the criminal defendant asserting an alibi, is that in some circumstances, even though the general rule is that if you're charged with a criminal offence, you don't have to prove anything, that's not entirely correct because if you're raising a defence, you do have this evidential burden. Same thing applies if, you're, if, you're, if your defence is self-defence or provocation, you've got to show uh, as a defence, you've got to come up with something that gets that argument within the ballpark. Otherwise, if defence didn't have to raise any suggestion of it, then arguably in order to secure a conviction, prosecution would positively have to disprove every defence that might be available to every defendant in every case. Does that make sense? But if the defendant says in a record of interview, for example, look, I hit him, but it was in self-defence, that's enough 
to show now, okay, now it's back on prosecution to establish beyond reasonable doubt that self-defense is not a, a defense within this, within this case. So there's got to be something to put it back onto prosecution. So this is where this, the nuance and the subtlety comes into it. Um, I think we could probably say that the um, prosecution in a murder case is the highest burden of um, case. But I also wanted to draw your attention to issues to do with civil and the Brigginshaw standard. Now, this is where, as I mentioned last week, I have a slightly different view to others, potentially, um, who say that the civil standard, you know, when we consider Brigginshaw, goes beyond on the balance of probabilities. I say it always stays balance of probabilities, but depending on the importance of the decision, the importance of the outcome, the arbiter, in fact, is entitled to say, I want better evidence. It's still on the balance of probabilities, but I, I, I need better evidence before I'm willing to make that call. That's what I see Brigginshaw as being. All right. Um, now let's um, move on a little, and um, I know time is getting away, but thank you for your patience. So what are the questions that we need to ask in terms of proving a case? Evidence. What are the three critical questions? I'll give you a hint. Number one is, is the evidence relevant? It'll get you started on my train of thought here. Sorry, Angela, what did you have in mind? Yeah, relevance, admissibility yes. and weight. Great. That's it. You've got to keep that firmly in mind. Any question that you answer in evidence law, look at it for at least conceptually from that perspective. Relevance, admissibility and weight. Excellent. That introduces then this idea of having a road map so that you're following some degree of a system. How many of you have taken some time to actually look at the Commonwealth Evidence Act? Have we all done that? Yep. All right. Has anyone come across the excellent flowchart, which you'll find towards the start of 3.1? Yes. Elise has. You found it. Sarah has as well. Even though this does not apply, at least strictly, in Queensland law, that flowchart, and this is the act itself, is excellent. And you'll find the flowchart in the Evidence Act, Commonwealth, at the start of Chapter 3, which deals with the topic of admissibility of evidence. And question number one in that flowchart is, is the evidence relevant? It's always the first question. From that, other rules apply. And you'll see that even though we have the three basic questions that one needs to ask themselves, by reference to the flow chart, the question of admissibility can be broken down into a number of questions. And that's where a lot of this evidence unit is, is f uh, featured. Is the evidence admissible as evidence? So, um, and that's where we bring in these sub-questions in, in order to determine whether it's admissible or not. Does the um, hearsay rule apply? Does the opinion rule apply? Um, does the tendency rule apply? And again, that's McPhillamy's case. Does the credibility rule apply, etc.? Does privilege apply? So if you want to get some idea, a bit of a roadmap, think about those three questions that Angela correctly identified and expand that by looking at the flowchart in the Evidence Act Commonwealth. Relevance is defined in that Commonwealth legislation at section 55. It is not defined in the Queensland legislation. Therefore, we need to consider the common law. But what essentially would you say are the two things that show that evidence is relevant. What are the two key issues? Yes, Angela? Um, it needs to be about a fact in issue. Yes. And it needs to be able to persuade someone one way to the, or the other that it actually happened. That's it. Yeah, it's got to have a bearing on the, the final outcome. That, that's the general rule. There are a few little nuances. We won't worry about that now, but that's right. To be relevant, it's got to, it's got to prove something that is material 
and it's got to have a bearing on the issue in the trial. So, and sometimes there's a difference between bare relevance and legal relevance. And this is where you need to expand on the toolkit that you would have started in introduction to law by adding in some definitions now. So what do we mean by bare, um, bare rel relevance? What do we mean by legal relevance? Um, and try and work that out. Look, I'll just give you an example from a practical perspective, and that is a no case to answer submission. Has anyone read about that? No case to answer? All right. So I had actually an instance of this last week, but um, let's say in a civil case, you're acting for the defendant or in a civil case, and you've listened carefully to the evidence led by the plaintiff and you're not convinced. You're not convinced that the plaintiff has led enough evidence to even warrant you having to stand up and say, I'm now going to call evidence in rebuttal. So you stand up at the end of the prosecution case and you say, Your Honour, I wish to make a no case to answer submission. And that's actually what you do. And you say, the basis upon which I argue there is no, ca no case to answer is that the plaintiff has not submitted evidence before, the, before this court, which is sufficient to warrant the court asking for defence to provide an answer. In other words, um, or it may be, uh, Your Honour, I submit there's no case to answer because even though there is some evidence presented by the plaintiff, the quality of the evidence is so poor that it does not justify the fence having to be called upon to provide evidence to respond to it. Now, insufficiency talks about the legal issues. Let's take an example. A plaintiff sues on a loan and says the loan has not been repaid by the defendant. The defendant's case all along is there is no loan. You didn't you didn't lend me any money, I've got nothing to repay. Now, the, defend, the plaintiff may come to court and produce evidence of bank statements, um, affidavits, statutory, um, you know, whatever it might be, all to prove that nothing was repaid. But at no stage, perhaps in, arguably, has the plaintiff ever said, here is evidence of the loan in the first instance. Now, it might be a gift or it might be that it's never been paid or whatever. But um, just by saying you, the defendant has not paid anything does not go to establish the primary argument by the plaintiff that money was lent in the first place. So if the plaintiff's evidence falls short of actually showing that the loan was ever created in the first instance, then really you've got no case to answer. There's no sufficient evidence in that regard. Alternatively, you might have a case where someone argues um, something, you know, say under Peace and Good Behaviour Act or something, to say, look, I'm in fear of this person, but their evidence is so poor. It's just, it's just no, there's no quality there that you argue that there's no case to answer. Now, in reality, here's where you need to be careful. And you need to listen to what it is that the magistrate or judge has to say in response to a no case to answer, because when the court is considering whether or not there is a case to answer, the court is not determining the question of balance of probabilities at that stage in the criminal context or not considering the question beyond reasonable doubt at that stage. What they're really doing is asking themselves, is there enough evidence to warrant this being put to the further test? Is there enough evidence to justify some sort of argument. And what the magistrates will often do is give you a hint, or the judges, and they'll give you a hint, and they'll say, look, ultimately I'm satisfied that there is enough evidence to warrant the matter going to a defence. But I can indicate that the evidence presented by the plaintiff is very poor, and it's only barely made it over that, um, over that initial test. Um, so I dismiss the no case submission at this time. And then the magistrate or judge may say, now, do you wish to call evidence? If you then say, yes, I wish to call evidence, 
you might you might see the disappointment on the face because what they've done is given you enough of a hint to say there's enough evidence to warrant you giving to warrant you having to give evidence but i've already said the evidence of the plaintiff is really poor so and it highlights the difference between having just that enough evidence to warrant it going to defence as opposed to enough evidence to warrant the prosecution or plaintiff case actually succeeding. And again, we're talking about a nuance here and I hope I haven't confused you too much, but I will ask you to look into that and to um, consider that question of what is the type of evidence that needs to be presented in different circumstances what is the extent to which the evidence needs to be proved in different circumstances and how does that fit into a no case submission either in civil law or criminal law any questions about that now and i'm really inviting you to take that away with you and consider it during the next week and we can come back to that point next week all right any um, that's probably enough for tonight. I hope I haven't confused you too much by that uh, statement. But are there any questions, comments before we wrap up for this evening? On admissibility, does the rule in Swaffield work with the case of Brett Peter Cohen? Oh, that's a detail. I'll have to take that one on advisement. But probably, yes, I think. Um, we'll have Swaffield's an important case, and we'll look at that later. All right, any further questions? All good? Okay, well, I'll wrap up for this evening. Thank you very much for your attendance and we'll see you next week and I will look at the Q&A questions and provide some answers. All the best, bye then.